Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. As a huge Madness fan, it's a pleasure to chat. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. And you know. my, my first question today, Chris, I want to go right back and ask you, where did it all begin for you in music? If I'm right in thinking, I've watched Before We Was We and um, yeah. you talked about your dad being a musician. Yeah. Yeah, but you must know all the answers. <laughs> And I think, you know, my dad, yeah, is a musician and, um, but, you know, he, he, he sung these songs like sort of Cockney songs, you know, yeah. but he, he was in the folk music world, you know, so I used to go around with him. But, you know, he, he tried to teach me guitar, but I wasn't really, wasn't, I'm, I'm still not interested. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't until I was like 20 that, um, Lee, the sax player, he saw his guitar in a shop in Camden Town and he literally kind of made me get it, you know. Really, it's quite incredible when you think about it. So his, so Lee's influence was like the, what made you pick up a guitar again after you supposedly said you weren't interested? You know, it, it's, it's hard to think of it now. But I bought this guitar, you know, and then all I could do was like, play notes you know um and then mike lee and myself you know we just started learning songs you know and i got i suspect you haven't got it here you know i bought a book with chords in which was good because it had photos of where your fingers were supposed to go you know because a lot of those books they have little dots and you're like <laughs> you know well, what go, what finger goes there so that was quite good um, you know, I slowly learned chords, you know, and that's how I started. It was always, you know, you learn songs you like, you know, a lot of people, you know, unless you're a real sort of genius and you just start writing songs straight away. Well, I imagine someone like Prince was probably like that. But, you know, like, yeah, you know, usually I always say it's the best thing to do is to learn. And that's what we did, you know, we learned stuff we liked. You know, and mentioned you there mentioning Lee Mike. Was it right you formed the the band in the mid seventies when you were known as the Invaders? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we really, literally, it was just us three. You know, but other people came in and out. Like you know, Carl, like Chaz, he came. You know, he could he could play anything, and he's playing bass. And then someone else was playing bass, and we had different drummers and. Do you know what I mean? All those kind of things that you go through. And um, I think, you know, when we got the final band, you know, we were all friends of friends. You know, we didn't necessarily know each other, but when we were doing, you know, you said that we was we. Um, when we did the book, it was crazy. It was like Woody went to the same primary school as me. But, you know, he's much younger than me. Do you know what I mean? Our paths crossed. Yeah. You know, because um, London, well, you know, isn't that big. <laughs> it is, but, you know, our yeah, part of London wasn't that big. Area, it was like North yeah. London, Highbury kind of, you know, yeah. So how, how did the madness thing come about then? Like, how did, how did you decide on the name Madness and what was um, the band, well, band members? Yeah, I mean, we were all sitting around trying to think of names and we thought of the invaders and we thought that was really good, you know. And then um, I think it was Jimmy Percy in Sham 69, he got this record label and he signed a band called the Invaders, who actually, if you go and really look, you can find them. Do you know what I mean? There's a few other invaders, but there was this, you know, I kind of tracked them. I think they even found a photo of them or some artwork. Anyway, they kind of didn't get anywhere. So we had to, but we still had to change our name. Mm. And um, yeah, Mike Barson, <laughs> he said, the Pirates. And I went, Mike, you know, there's a band called the Pirates because the original Pirates had reformed, you know, without Johnny Kidd, obviously, because Johnny Kidd's dead. So then um, he said, Morris and the Miners, you know, and that's like a terrible name. And we did this show at the place called The Music Machine which then became the Camden Palace, it's now called Coco. We did a show there and they said Morris and the Miners, but 
actually uh, with sore throat, this band we knew we supported. Actually, you know, when we did that show, we'd already changed the name, you know, because we just said the name's no good, you know, and then Woody said, so he tells me, Woody said, well, how about a song from the set list? You know, and I kind of grabbed the set list and I went, yeah, madness, you know. And he went, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, this is it, you know. And I thought it's a terrible name. Um, and But there you go, you know, it kind of suits us. So, yeah, we did that thing at the music machine. And it was also, the uh, Taz, you know, Carl, he, um, he was like, you know, following a band around and dancing and stuff. And I remember that particular show, he got on the stage and he like stayed on stage. Do you know what I mean? And it just seemed good, you know, him doing the old flipping. So that's how he kind of got in, in the band, <coughs> you know, originally. Yeah. So, so after that, obviously you sort of formed as a band. Who were your biggest influences like in the band all around? Like I'm aware, Prince Buster's quite a big one. Yeah, I mean, sort of. I think the sort of Prince Buster thing um, was Suggs came to a rehearsal and he had a version of Madness, a song. And you know what, though? I think it was Georgie Fame. Georgie Fame did it, you know, and did a really good version. So we kind of like that sort of music. And as I say, we started off doing these songs we liked. You know, like Poison Ivy, uh, Eden Jail House Rock. We, you know, but everybody did them. Mm. So we started doing these kind of like reggae type songs, Swan Lake, uh, Madness. Uh, and, and no one else was doing that, you know. So we were a bit unique until, you know, the specials came down to London and we realised they were doing a similar thing. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, what was the it's kind of like, yeah, that's how we got to where we got to. Yeah, but we, we liked Prince Buster, but we liked Alex Harvey. And, you know, I think the most important one is Ian Jury. Yeah. You know, and he, he had this band called Kilburn and High Roads, um, one of his early bands, you know, and they were, like, brilliant. And we used to go and see them a lot. And they, um, you know, they had a sax, they had a piano. You know, they had the same things we had. So very inspirational. Yeah, and the music they did was kind of reggae, you know, sort of rock and roll. Um, not so much Motown, but they were all things that influenced us, you know. So, talking about the ska reggae songs that influenced you, in 1979, you mm. released, obviously, The Prince is Your First Single, followed up by... One Step Beyond My Girl and then finally Night Brought to Cairo where yeah. then the album One Step Beyond came out and peaked at number two in the UK as a band after like quickly coming onto the scene so much how did you take that success? Yeah I mean how old are you? 16 Alright all right. I mean I, I was quite old I was like 23 but not, you know, we weren't sort of arrogant, but I knew that we were good. Yeah. And I knew, you know, I think we all knew, you know, that we really had something. You know, once we started writing songs and we did that album, we knew we had something that, you know, there was loads of other bands that were just flashing the pan. And that's why, you know, we signed to Stiff Records. They were like really good. The guy that ran it, Dave Robinson, he could see, he could see a sort of future yeah. for us. But, um, it, it was, um, you know, I'm somewhat an underachiever. And, uh, you know, the first single came out and it got to, like, number 60. And I was like, yes, yes, number 60. You know, I thought it was, this was, you know, that, because for me, that was incredible, you know. Yeah. It was incredible, you know. And then you walk down the street and you hear it on the radio. I remember some blokes on a building site. You know, and that's fantastic feeling, that sort of thing. And then I think when we got on top of the pots, we were so lucky because yeah, we were like number sixty. Yeah. They'd never, they'd never do anything like that now. You'd have to be, you know, in the top, top ten. 10. Top ten. <laughs> and yeah, we got on top of the pots, and um, then we did that tour, 
you know, one step beyond come out and that was it, you know, num top three, you know, and then my girl, we didn't want Nightboat to be a single because we actually thought, you know, he's ripping people off, mm. which, you know, putting too many singles from an album. Mm. And we had this big argument and that's why the video was very, you know, people like the video, but it was really at the last minute. And what we said was, we'll only do it if we can do what's called, you will know this is young man, an EP, which was like a small single, you know, single size, but it had four songs on. Yeah. You know, we said, we're only going to do it if no. we can do three other songs, on, on three new ones, you know. Um, but I mean, nowadays we'd probably put 10 singles out, you know, you wouldn't, you know, things are kind of entirely different the way things are now. But that, that's, yeah, so I mean, it was like sudden. It was sudden, but it was like um, so fast, do you know what I mean? That we, we, we were just on tour all the time, you know. The, the Top of the Pops, what you mentioned in particularly, are great performances, but can I ask what happened with you as a Top of the Pops? Because I've seen somewhere, I think it was, was it Suggs or someone that said, He's were banned from it, I suppose, four times. No, I mean, they, you know, some of the band haven't got very good memories or they, you know, elaborate on things. But, you know, we were often late uh, and, but really, you know, talking about, you know, being famous or whatever, that programme, people watched it to see the bands. They watched it to see us. They didn't watch it to see the DJs. You know, you know, they watched it to see the bands. And, you know, and the BBC was an incredibly powerful thing. And they had this big building. And, and they used to get us there at like 8 o'clock in the morning. And, like, you know, I'm not saying we should have been waiting on hand and foot. But, you know, they kind of stick us in this basement, you know, in this little room that was almost like a flipping prison cell. And th then they'd sort of say, right, you know, you're on. Or they'd make us hang around all day, you know, and then we'd go on. And then very often, the, you know, there would be a guitar solo and they'd go to the bass, you know, just they didn't really do the job that well either. But, you know, I think people like Lee would often, we'd rehearse the song, you know, a few times, you know, and we'd all get it right. And then he would do something totally different when we filmed it, you know, and the director got really annoyed, you know, and I mean, looking back on it now, because, you know, I'd get annoyed, you know, if I'm idiots doing something, you know, and, um, you know, there were, okay, yeah, we, we were late and um, there was a woman who looked after us, it was really nice, and I liked her, you know, and she, she kind of, you know, couldn't really deal with it, so, uh, record company, Dave Robinson, he got in these two pluggers, these two guys that were a bit more, you know, can, could control us a bit more. And, but at one stage, yeah, the BBC, what they said was that if we did one more kind of bad thing, they would ban everyone on stiff records, which I think is totally unfair, you yeah. know, isn't it? You know, they would ban everyone on our label if we did anything wrong. Um, and, you know, I mean, Really, we, you know, as songs just went in the charts anyway. So they couldn't, you know, they could have kind of banned us. We, in the end, we came to this uneasy alliance where everybody really liked our videos. So they would show the videos. But, you know, they had these very strict rules, like you couldn't go on one, two consecutive weeks. You know, you had to go up in the charts. They'd show the video, but then the next time, you went on, you know, you, you had to do it live. And actually the other day, um, someone asked me something about a guitar that I'm playing and, I, and it was on top of the pops. So I went and looked up that top of the pops and it was our house. And um, actually, you know, they did a really, you know, good thing. They built this little room, you know, and, you know, I remember going and saying, Frank, you know, it's really great, you know, because um, I never had to be, beef with him. Do you know what I mean? Tomo used to, um, because he doesn't like being told what to do, you know. Um, 
but but really no. I mean, we 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 you know we didn't get banned four times. You know, a lot of those stories are all you know the mists of time. Yeah. They get all a bit exaggerated. And then I had a fight with twenty geezers, and I knocked them all out. You know, and really, I'm <laughs> a little kid. You know, um, you know what it's like. Yeah. But I, there, there was another story. I don't know if I, I don't know if this was another lie or whether it's true that um, one time. Carl and Suggs sprayed some confetti spray in one of the presenters' eyes or something. Oh, that was, um, there was this programme called Tiz Was. Do you know Chris Tarrant, who does Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Right, there was him and there was, this, there was a woman called Sally James and there's a loads of other people and it was this kids' programme and it was really like anarchy, you know, and they had this guy throwing these custard pies, you know, and this with a mask on. And they were on it and they had this silly string, you know, this stuff that you spray and it comes out like string. I don't oh, know if they have any yeah, these that, days. Yeah, that's a yeah. bit. And they sprayed it on her and it kind of went and I think her eyelash, she had the false eyelash came off and um, we found all the custard pies, you know, we were sort of like a bit too anarchic for them, you know, and I don't know that we got banned, but I can't remember going back. Yeah, and then everyone was like, oh, it's Sally James, but I think it was Chris Tarrant that banned us. Really? But, you know, it was like, it, it, you know, it was like a laugh. The programme was a laugh. Like, you know, it, it was a really funny programme. You know, um, Lenny Henry was on it, you know. Right. Yeah, he was, like, really funny. Yeah, it was, it was a good, uh, good programme, you know, to be on. Who would you say were the biggest jokers in the band? Well, it's got to be Tomo, really. You know, um, I suppose me a bit, but I mean, yeah, he's, you know, off and up to no good, shall we say. Yeah, I remember because, um, like I said to you when I first messaged you about this, I um, seen you in Newcastle on the 16th of December and yeah. I think, uh, like... Ah, uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, he was um, refreshed. Yeah. He had a day off. You know, I think, I don't know where I went. Maybe I went home. But he had a day off in Newcastle, you know. Yeah, he didn't, I think he behaved himself. And then, of course, the day of the gig, he went and got, like, you know, <sighs> drunk. And he turned up about 10 minutes before we were going to go on, and he was in the right state. Really? So, um, yeah, I mean, he, he um, we kind of, like, got someone to sober him up. We might have gone on a bit late, you know, but it was a bit bad. I mean, he said the next day he couldn't remember the gig, you know. And, um, but he does, he rehearses a lot, so I imagine, you know. Yeah, you'll be a professional at it, yeah. I mean, I've done that. I did that in the 80s, you know. Played this place called Dominion, and there's a pub over the road, and I got really drunk. And when we went on stage, I was thinking, where's the audience, you know? And I was standing with my back to the audience, and I, <laughs> You know, and but then, I mean, in those days, we used to play so much that, you know, you could, if you just do it in your sleep. And by that time, we got to Newcastle, we'd done a few shows. So we were pretty, you know, pretty muscle memory, you know. Yeah. It's called. Remembering it, yeah. Yeah. Back, um, back to the, after the late 70s now, after... Um, that first album, you wanted to have hit after hit after hit, uh, something to name, Embarrassment, It Must Be Love, House of Fun, but two in particular, which you're credited as a writer, Bang mm. Trousers and Our House. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a bit about the inspiration for them? Well, I mean, in those days, yeah, it's really funny, you know, I just sort of play the guitar and I think, oh yeah, you know, and I came up with the chords of baggy trousers. And, you know, and I wanted it to be more kind of rock, you know, yeah. than, than it was, you know. And then we would kind of go, right, which way are we going to do this song? Well, all right, we'll do it a bit scar, you know. And I think Suggs came up with that, dang, 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 dang you know, the, the in, intro notes, um, which are, in fact, if you want to look it up, there's a song called Hootsmon. By Lord Rockingham's Eleven, and it starts like that. Ding, ding, ding. But anyway, sorry. So that um, kind of wrote that, and um, yeah, Suggs did the lyrics. Um, 
I know like some things like the middle eight, do, 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 do. you know, I just kind of, we were rehearsing and I just went, oh look, you know, do you know what I mean? And like, we do this bit. And I always thought, oh God, this song, it hasn't got chorus. It's never going to get anywhere. And that was one of the biggest hits. It was in the charts for like 38 weeks or something. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I mean, I don't mean it was at number one, but. Like, it, it, yeah. Um, and then Our House, again, um, I had this song and it was a bit, it was a bit boring, really. You know, and Carl came up with those lyrics. And again, I mean, I seem to think, we said, oh, let's do it like Motown, you know? You know, dun, 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 And um, although, I mean, recently, like Bella said, we, we, we spent a lot more time than, I think, my camera's wobbling, look. <laughs> Stop leaning on the... Doing the beat of our house. <laughs> An earthquake. Quick. Sorry. So, um, obviously you've got such a big back catalogue, but I've just mentioned too that you're credited as a writer on, but um, as a catalogue in total, do you have any, like, a madness song, which is your favourite, not just because it's your favourite, it could bring back very good memories of recording yeah. or something like that? I mean, I always think, you know, The Prince, you know, that first single. Yeah. You know, sort of enjoy it, doing it live. Um, and, you know... Yeah, I don't know, it's just something about it, you know, really. Because I know what you mean there, because there is something special about a first and, like, a mm. first single, and, like, like you said, your excitement of, like, when it was building up in the charts, which you'd have obviously never experienced before, as it was yeah. the first single. We, we also talked about the music videos. Yeah. How, how fun was it filming them? Oh, it's good, you know. I mean, I think, you know, I often think that um, people don't realise the potential. Do you know what I mean? Like, I never thought I could write a song. Yeah. I never thought I could write a song, you know. I thought Lee wrote The Prince and then Mike wrote My Girl, and I thought, oh, you know, they can write all the songs. <laughs> and then you kind of write one and you think, oh, right, you know, it's not that hard. And it's like with videos, um, you know, um, we didn't do one for the prince we did one for one step beyond and we worked with this american director called chuck statler and he'd done this band called devo you know and we really liked his stuff and he had a kind of connection with stiff because uh he yeah i think devo were kind of on stiff but he'd done stuff with them so you know and he's this american guy and he was like really funny and he just kind of turned up and he had a full transit van you know and um he travelled with us, we were on tour, you know, and he filmed bits of the One Step Beyond, you know, going down the street and things like that, you know. And um, then he filmed us playing it live. But, you know, when he's doing it, you know, I was like, all oh, right, you know, right. So that's how, you know, that's how you do it. You, you know, because, I mean, they had the, the most, they had, like, you know, a cameraman, sound man, and a lighting man. You know, nowadays he's, like, 300 people. But... It, so they were quite maverick, you know, and could just we could just stop and go and film something, you know. Yeah. And he really, you know, at the beginning he goes, "Who are you?" And the guy gets up in the bed. He was this sort of skinhead bloke who hung around with us, <laughs> called Farron, and they really liked him. And um, I remember being, we were in his van, and they were in a van, you know, going along the motorway, and this Farron was sitting in the back of their van, you know, <laughs> and they sort of really liked him. <laughs> you know, we called their van the Chuck Wagon. I don't know if that. Because he's called Chuck, you know. So we did that, and we also did um, a video for Bed and Breakfast Man. Because oh, yeah. that was going to be a single, you know, and we did that with him. And then he had this other guy in that, this skinhead with glasses, that we called Joe 90, and he's sort of dancing. And, um, but, so, so do you know what I mean? We kind of, like, realised, you know, I'm not going to be Ponzi. You know, nowadays, it really is... is, is important artistic medium but we just thought hey these films are really good you know like it's fun doing them and you know they're good to promote a band because you can send it all around the world can't you a video yeah. so so we always thought they're good and then yeah the first one we did that we actually did was my girl which we did in the dublin castle pub 
where you, where you played your first gig, yeah. 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 And um, that, we, we built a stage and made it bigger. So they, they got a bigger stage out of it. And, yeah, it's a pretty straight video. You know, it's just us doing it live. But again, we kind of learned, you know, and then Dave Robinson, the boss of Steve, you know, he's directed it and he got us all to sing a line from the song and it was all a bit sort of in the naff. <laughs> but, but, you know, no, I mean, he had some good ideas, Dave, you know, and then and then we did the night boat one. Yeah, one which was us just mucking about. And then I'm trying to think, then the embarrassment one, that was when, you know, I went, oh, like, you know, and Lee was like, I want to be, um, I want to have a smoke machine and do the sax solo and be, you know, and all these kind of ideas. You know, Lee always had really good I visual ideas, usually to do with himself, with something he would be doing, like flying in baggy trousers. So I did the embarrassment one, yeah, and I got these suits and there was these sort of music stands. Yeah, and again, there wasn't much in that, but there's baggy trousers. You know, we started really elaborating and Tomo flew. That was the one when everyone went, oh my, you know, he's flying. And he wanted to fly. And we got this crane, you know, with a wire. And oh, then, yeah. you know, I went to watch the, you know, the film we'd done. And it's like, you can't see the wire. You couldn't see the wire, you know. You know, in those days, it's, there's no such thing as CGI. It was like, yeah. that geezer's flying, you know. Yeah. And then... Um, <laughs> Because because by then, Stiff, you know, they had this building and, and they had, we had our own editing suite. So it's fantastic, you know, we used to do the films, you know, I'd get really excited. We'd get the films developed, literally, and then we'd go into the Stiff offices. You know, and like I was quite involved in the editing of them. You know, I got like really interested in that and the filming, you know. And um, it was great because, you know, people at Stiff come in and they start laughing and we thought, yeah, we've got a good one here, you know, because, you know, we never really did a sort of serious yeah. video because it was impossible, you know, <laughs> to do something serious, um, really. <laughs> Somebody's always, you know, doing something stupid. But, 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 you know, it's one of those things that I never thought I could make a film. You know, I never thought I could edit a video. But, you know, there's millions of people out there and maybe you, Baker, that can do these things if given a chance. It's very true. And if, if, if you don't try something, you're not going to know, like you were saying. Mm. Yeah. And I personally, I, I just love watching the music video and I just think they're so entertaining. Yeah. I can just imagine the amount of fun you had making them. I mean, yeah, most of them we did. I mean, sometimes it was a bit... Because in them... Um, the video for Shut Up. I wanted us to dance on the ceiling, yeah. like for a stair. And where we went wrong, you know, we filmed like loads of stuff and then the bit on the ceiling, we did that all in one go. Do you, do you know what I mean? So they had to build the room and we went through the room. Then they had to turn the room upside down and then we went through, you know, and it was like three in the morning and we were really like, you know, <laughs> so really we should have built the room, gone off and done a load of stuff while they turn the room upside down. Do you know what I mean? That's it. Yeah. Now I would have tripping, had a little bit of a shooting schedule. <laughs> no. But, um, but no, they were always, you know, I mean, there were like, there were arguments, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in, when we did It Must Be Love, you know, Taz didn't like the idea of a hearse and, um, I know when we did Our House, we were in that room, you know, and Dave wanted to do a certain shot, Robbo, and he was telling people where to go, but I don't want to do it, you know, and he kind of lost it. Yeah. And he, he lost it, you know, and he walked off and I had to go and get him, him come, you know, because I knew what, you know, I'm looking through the camera too, and you can't yeah. fit that many, you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to have people in a certain place <laughs> and, but you know there wasn't there was never anything you know you know i can't remember anything bad yeah it was always like a laugh i am i imagine though like when you are in a band and there's many of you so you've got many different ideas there is bound to be a bit of like disagreements over who does what and that's that's normal what what would you say have you got a most funniest story with madness oh, you know people always ask me that and i can never think of one 
the most madness um, story. Yeah, and then when when I've gone, I thought, oh yeah, you know. I mean, there was one thing where we did this thing at Butlins, and um, somebody like had given Suggs this bit of paper saying that they wanted to propose to the girlfriend or something like that, you know. So he reads it out, and this girl like starts shouting at the back. We're like, let her through, let her through, you know, let this girl through, you know. And she comes through, she comes to the station. It wasn't her. It was just like some random, you know. And in fact, there was this other time in the 80s, we were in Germany, and we're doing this show, you know, it's all going really good. And this guy come out, you know, with a big hat, you know, like, oh, rah, rah. He sort of gets the microphone. <laughs> and, you know, the show stops, and he's saying something. And, um, He's obviously a voice of authority. So I said to one of the, what's he saying? And he was literally saying, the, the owner of the Ford Escort in the car park has left their lights on. You know, that's what he was saying. That's what, you know, registration. And we like, got his, chucked his hat, you know, got rid of him. He was all right, Blakey from On The Buses. You ever seen that? Um, on The Buses? No, I don't. Oh, you should watch it. It's about these... Happy go lucky people, you know, bus driver and his mate, and like, you know, they're always getting up to these very un PC escapades involving women. You know, they just work, you know, on the buses, but they have this um, boss, and he's called Blakey, and he's got his little moustache like Hitler, you know, and he's one of the great, you know, English comedy creations, you know, because he's always trying to get them. You know, he's always trying to get him. Try and watch on the buses. He's probably on like ITV3. Um, In fact, I was watching it the other day and it's just hilarious. It's just hilarious, you know, really. That sort of thing. <laughs> it was very funny. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely have a look for that because you can't beat an old British sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, Chris, it's been a pleasure to chat. The last topic I want to go back to is the tour. If you want to say, um, Ah, you bought a, a very good seat. Hold on, what have I got? I've got something. Can we can prove it? I can prove it by the fez. Hey, there's oh yeah, they were on sale as well. They're great. Little, I thought they were really good. Yeah, the the, the, the merchandise store was very good. The program yeah. as well, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, but like the the sea of I know you would have seen even more, but like the sea of people in front of me because we were pretty close to the front. There were just so many fezzes. Yeah, it was they're just, good sellers. They're good sellers, you know. And like one year, I was like, oh, you know, let's do blue ones with gold writing. I thought, yeah, because they look so cool, but everyone just wants a red one. Yeah, and it's from like you know, it's kind of from like Tommy Cooper. You know, who Tommy Cooper is. I just don't know who he is, do you? The, the, oh, you've got a lot to do, son. Too. <laughs> the, 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 the name rings a bell. The name rings a bell. He's this comedian. Um, he's yeah. this big guy, and he was just hilarious, you know, and he had this face, and he used to put his hair out, you, you, you know, like, sort of so it stuck out a bit. And he did these tricks that, you know, that never went, you know, they kind of went wrong, but he was actually a really good musician. And, I mean, he's, he's comedy, you know, was, you know, surreal <laughs> but he was very, very funny, you know, and we, we loved Tommy Cooper. And is that where the idea of the first came from? Yeah, sort of, you know, where it's just yeah. obviously associated with Cairo, you know. Yeah, yeah, because in the uh, video, um, is it is it Lee that has the pheasant in the Cairo video? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, he's the only yeah. one who's got one on. And yeah, and if you look, his hair's... Yeah. See? Homage to yeah. Tommy Cooper. Like, but to Cairo video... What what I want to say was how how did it feel being back on the road? Because I know it'll have obviously been a while for not just new, but oh yeah, like, I mean it was it was really like it was quite a bit stressful because that tour we'd done the photos, you know those photos, yeah, for the program we did them in March 2020 or February. Sure. We were just about to announce the tour. When everything, the world shut down. You know? Awesome. The, that tour was supposed to be the December, November of 2020. 2020, yeah. Wow. And um, so we, we, you know, we finally get together and we get all the set built and, you know, and all that. I'm really pleased with all that. 
And, you know, and then we go, we start a tour and, um, yeah, yeah, there was a lot of bumpy roads on the way, but, you know, we eventually get going and then suddenly it's like, oh, Omnicron, you know, the new, oh my God, you know, oh, 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 don't panic, you know. <laughs> so we, we, you know, a lot of people didn't come. Yeah, which is and, and you can't kind of, you know, obviously, you know, they had grandparents or they didn't want to ruin their Christmas. But I mean, honestly, this Omnicron thing, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, Mike Barson, got COVID just before we did Butlins, you know? Uh, yeah, was it the House of Fun Weekend or Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he, it was me and him and Suggs, we went to, to meet our accountant and these people, and um, the accountant rings me up and he goes, I've got COVID, you know? And I'm like, right, you know, well, I feel all right. And then Mike started feeling ill, and then he had it, so then I had to get tested and I was all right. Suggs had already had it. Um, anyway, so he didn't do buttons. So then we do this turn, it's like, you know, you've got to do a test every day, and you know, and it was all going along. And, um, you know, got all the way through it. And then the the drum guy, the drum roadie, he got it just about four or five shows before the end. And then, um, but because of this Omnicron, you know, panic, you know, more and more people started not coming and they were writing to Twitter and they were writing to the website saying, you know, you've got to cancel it. And you can't, you can't, you just can't. Um, Because yes. we would have been liable for like, you know, yeah. God knows how much. And, and there's all those people that did come, you know, so it's re really, really difficult because like the last two shows were really difficult. Mm. And I did find something interesting now which is that any kind of event, 6% of the people don't come. They just don't come because, you know, they lost the ticket or the wheel order. But, you know, obviously with us, it went up and up and up and up. I mean, we, we, we really winged it. We really winged it, you know, we just, because I was speaking to my accountant the other day, just, you know, general catch up. And um, he said loads of people are having to cancel their tours. And yeah. I, you know, I know there's people out there that have got really ill, but I'm quite old. Um, now, I know I'm not vaccinated. And during the tour, the amount of things I did that put me in danger of catching it, you know, and I didn't, yeah. right? And so, so we were doing like, I came home from Nottingham and then my wife went to London then that night she came home and then, I don't know, you know, and then I, I went off on a tour and then she goes, oh, feeling ill. And she had COVID, right? So, um, so on the 21st of December, and what was it? It was like, we did, we did the O2 and then we had a yeah, day off. We did two Wembley. Two the O2, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, it's like one night at the O2 and that sold out. So we did Wembley. So, so the O2, I was going to come home because I had a day off. So I stayed in London, the O2, after the O2. Then I went to Wembley, did Wembley and came home. And of course, you know, like a good husband, I'm like looking after her and like, you know, can you go and make me this and that? So of course, as you can guess, I caught it on like the 20, just before Christmas. And, um, you know, so the in-laws didn't come down. I mean, uh, what a shame. And um, no, I mean, they, you know, they didn't come down. It was a shame. And, um, you know, my daughter was very worried about it. So, because she wanted to have a party on New Year's Eve. She's <laughs> she's 15, right? She wanted, you know, so I was in the freaking spare room. And, and I mean, I had, you know, I was lucky. I was lucky. You know, I was very, very achy back, you know, really bad for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And then I felt iffy, you know, for, for a while. You know, it's like a very bad flu. So, you know, touch flipping, touch, hold it, this is me, you know. touch words. Yeah, I've got a wood table right in front of me. Yeah. See that? You see this? I keep like throwing it away. <laughs> and it comes back. <laughs> what, what, what is it? A boomerang, son. Oh, God almighty. What do I <laughs> teach you at school? Do you know what a boomerang is? Um, this. We, in, in, in our days, we, we had 
the similar thing but like frisbees and a round shape where that would come back yeah boomerang yeah. it's like this you know in australia the indigenous people oh, yeah it's got used yeah. to throw this you know a, a blooming kangaroo or whatever you know and if it hit it it would knock it out or kill it and then if it didn't it would come back it's very clever very clever and i've got that in australia in in, in the 80s was that on tour or just the trip pardon no we we went to australia you know yeah. finally chris it's, it, it's um one one thing i want to ask you what was a highlight song to play on tour with madness and um, i think um it must be love is good. Yeah. Because that, um, that, that a while was... ago, I had this idea of like, we stop playing and everybody sings it. And it's really, you know, you do feel the love, you know, because yeah. that's a lovely song. That's a lovely song. And um, um, also, you know, it's like you think, right, the, the set's nearly, it's nearly finished. <laughs> I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, those shows, you know, they flew by, you know, when we, you're playing. They sort of seemed to go really quick. And it was very enjoyable. You know, I'm, I'm glad we managed to do it, you know. And, you know, thank you if anyone's watching that came. And if anyone watching that didn't come, I'm really sorry. And I'm trying to think of something to, you know, but it's quite difficult. It's, it's a very hard situation for a band, I guess, because I went to see um, f four concerts in December, one band every week, but... It was sort of like it split off. I went to see the Charlatans, and then after yeah. that, it sort of like split off. And it was using Shed Seven, and like you, you, the last two using them were like the ones where people were like really like hammering on Twitter for you to cancel the gigs. Yeah, it, it, it isn't doable for you as a band, but it's, 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 it's hard, like you say, because you don't want to upset the fans who want to go, but then the fans who. Yeah. Don't want to go are going to obviously be so it's it's it, it's a no-win situation for the band really yeah i mean i you know like we those last two i mean there again it's like 40 percent are not coming to wembley and you know wembley we hadn't sold that many you know that many and i thought oh you know and i came out and i just thought hold on you know it didn't look embarrassingly empty and um i think a lot of the people that see us staying you know so maybe those people thought oh you know i don't want to be standing you know do you know what i mean but as far as i know you know there wasn't any like massive spikes in COVID, yeah. you know uh, i mean he's like i mean have you had it um yes i had it at the end of july and um yeah. well i've done on it well i still touched the wood in case i caught it again but i was i was fine yeah, I mean, you're only a young fella. And what, did you get vaccinated or anything? Okay. No. It's all right. It's not against the law. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not, you know, if someone wants to get vaccinated, I, you know, I don't, do you know what I mean? It's not that I hate them. It's but, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I didn't fancy it um, for various reasons. You know, my wife didn't, you know, and everyone... <laughs> Um, it's personal if they all call covid everyone i know that flipping and in fact you know there's it's all different it's, it's everybody's different you know there's a couple we know they're the same age he's vaccinated she is and they got it he wasn't too bad she was she's all right and then he, he was ill for for weeks months my wife helps him she's like a homeopath which is another thing that people think is like witchcraft, but she sorted them out, you know. But it's everybody's different, aren't they? Yeah. You know? it's... I mean, Sug's got it bad, but then he smokes, you know. I gave up smoking like 20, 19 years ago, so, you know. Yeah, you know, I try to stay healthy. Anyway, let's, let's look forward to... You know, everything getting back to normal, everybody being okay, and you know. Let's hope that hopefully concerts this year and gigs can just go smoothly. And yeah, that leads me on to you finally say, have you got anything in store with Madness for this year? I know there's the Tramlines Festival news that headline. Yeah, we've got a few things coming up. You know, yeah, no, like no major, you know. Yeah, major event. Summer festival. Yeah, yeah, and a few shows. Yeah.